Hello and good evening everyone and um, thank you very much for joining us and um, a very warm welcome to anyone joining us on our webinar series for the first time this evening and a very warm welcome back to anyone who joined us yesterday as well when we kicked off the NSS conference making ADSB work and um, really happy to have um, so many of you with us yesterday and really excited to have you with us again today for our second webinar in the series and um, a few small bits of housekeeping from me uh, before I'll pass over to Steve Smith, our director, and then on to Andrew Anderson, our much anticipated speaker for this evening. Um, as you've all been doing so far, if you can just please continue to ensure that your microphone is muted and your video is turned off for the duration. And please do note that the presentation will be recorded. This is so that it's available for people who aren't able to join the webinar this evening. If you do have a question that you would not like to be um, recorded within the presentation if it's discussed please do just let us know and we can ensure that that's the case and um, to ensure that your network connection is as strong as possible and um, please do close all other applications you have on your device as possible um, and also if you are having other difficulties please do also refer to the joining instructions for the event for guidance as well we were really happy with the participation that we had in yesterday's session on Pigeonhole, our Q&A platform. We had 16 different questions that were asked and um, we had um, some furious voting on some of them as well, which was excellent to see. So I would encourage you all of you um, in advance to log on to pigeonhole.at and use the passcode for this um, webinar series, which is NSS Conference. And um, this is where the questions will be selected from for our speaker to discuss at the end of the presentation. So please do go on, submit your questions and also please vote on the ones you would most like to see answered. Finally, um, as was the case yesterday, we nearly got through all the questions, um, but any that we're not able to get through um, that are submitted, we'll endeavour to answer them afterwards uh, when the presentation is finished. So please do still submit your questions, even if you see a busy page in front of you. Fantastic. Um, without further ado then, I will pass over to the Director of New Southern Sky, um, Steve Smith, to give a short few opening remarks um, and to introduce our speaker today, Andrew Anderson. Over. Right, thank you Lorcan and uh, welcome everybody to the second webinar in the series Making ADSB Work. Uh, tonight it's my great pleasure to introduce you to Andrew Anderson. Now some of you will remember Andrew from his live performance in Auckland at the NSS conference 2018 and I'm pleased to say that Andrew is back by popular demand. Andrew is an instrument rated pilot from Sydney, Australia, where he is an information technology consultant. Andrew has been flying since 1979 and an airplane owner since 1989. A passionate advocate for general aviation, he is Vice President, Pacific Region of the International Council of Aircraft Owner and Pilot Associations and is Chair of Australia's General Aviation Advisory Network. Now for the past decade, he's been an active participant in the Australian Strategic Air Traffic and Management Group, ASTRA, in a number of roles, including co-chair of the SBAS subgroup. Now he's recently been helping us, the NSS SBAS subgroup, to understand the opportunities and challenges ahead. We thank you for that, Andrew, it's been terrific. Now, Andrew is a great friend of New Zealand Aviation and we welcome him back as one of our own to talk about making the most of ADSB. Over to you, Andrew, thank you. Thank you, Steve, and uh, thank you for such a warm introduction. And uh, it's a great pleasure and, and, and a privilege, really, to uh, be able to speak with you tonight about uh, ADSB and, and a pers the perspective of, of a participant, of someone who had to equip, who's someone who's been flying with it now for eight years and nearly a thousand hours. Let's go to the presentation. So I might just do a quick quality check here. Uh, Lorcan, Steve, the slide is visible. Slide is visible and you're loud and clear, Andrew. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Lorcan. Um, I need to point out that the remarks I'm going to make this evening uh, and, and my various comments, um, they're my own. Um, I am a member of, of a number of different organisations and involved in different things, but um, the uh, comments that I'll make tonight uh, are those of myself. Um, I've, as I mentioned, I've, I've had a fair bit of experience in flying that little Cessna around 
uh, with ADSB now for uh, about eight years. And uh, I'd like to share with you an, uh, some perspective on just what makes it work and how it works. Uh, and inherent in that is how we take advantage of surveillance based air traffic services. And then uh, as we move through it, um, there's a few areas from a pilot's point of view uh, that I'd like to call out um, as uh, some observations and suggestions. We'll have time for questions at the end. Uh, I'd uh, prefer, I think, to keep moving through the uh, presentation now and uh, we'll make sure we cover as many of your questions as we can um, towards the end. Um, there's a list of some of the different things I've done there and, and Steve uh, has uh, been very kind to give me such a warm introduction. So um, I'll uh, move on from that. The one thing that I would say is that uh, unashamedly and with no apology, my remarks are very strongly connected and directed to general aviation. Uh, we can cover airlines and we can cover large aircraft and we can cover military and we can cover uh, gliders in another presentation. But today I'm really focused on a general aviation pilot and owner's perspective uh, of uh, the introduction of ADSB in Australia. And it raises a really important point that I'd like to share with you. And I mentioned this uh, when I joined uh, with you in, 19, uh, uh, in uh, 2018 as well. And that is that um, we really have to accept if we're going to be in general aviation that things change. There's a concept uh, in the minds of many of us as we get older that says, oh, you know, it was all better in 1974 or it was all easier in 1983. But in reality, technology changes. Things improve and get better. And ADSB is very much in that category. And our goal, therefore, has to be to make the most of those changes and figure out the best way uh, to participate in that progress. Transitioning to ADSB has really three fundamental questions. More than, more than anything else that we need to think about, we need to think about what do we need to install? How do we do it? And when do we do it? We need to look at the ground infrastructure, where and when are we going to get access to ADSB driven surveillance services. And then we should start to look at how and when the ADSB services will be used. And our experience here in Australia in general aviation has been it's been a lot more than just the normal day to day air traffic control interactions between pilot and controller. Uh, and we'll cover some of that as we work through some of the slides. The first question that we raised in our list of three questions is what we do to equip a general aviation aircraft. Now, I just asked the question, you look at the picture of that aircraft, who would not want to have a Bonanza equipped like that? And of course we all would. The reality of it is that we can do so many things with general aviation aircraft, thanks to the enormous uh, capabilities of equipment available today. You know, when I look back and think about the types of aircraft that uh, I flew in the 70s and 80s, uh, if anyone had suggested to me that you would be flying a Cessna 182 equipped with a glass cockpit, capable of detection by air traffic services in places like Burke in far western New South Wales or Ayers Rock that we'll talk about a bit later, uh, I would have shook my head and said, don't be, don't be stupid. It was amazing enough when I encountered my first autopilot in the 80s. If you look at that yellow block on the right, you'll see the, in the bottom half of it, a list of a lot of things that we can equip with in terms of flight automation, automated power plant management, a huge array of technology driven uh, features which can be translated into capabilities towards the top. And the question that we all need to ask when equipping for ADSB is what capabilities do I really need? And I su suggest to you it's a question more of capability than equipment. Everybody would love to have the equipment in the bottom left box. And we had a number of aircraft owners and pilots in Australia who were disappointed about the cost of equipping with ADSB because some of the options that are available to New Zealand aircraft equipping now weren't available in Australia when we went through our equipment phase um, five, six, seven years ago. As a result, it's very easy to get drawn into champagne taste on a beer budget. 
it's easy to get into this idea that I need to have it all and I want to have it all. And then to say, well, it's because of ADSB that I've incurred those costs and it doesn't need to be that way. I only say this because of the number of people here who had some problems. In with 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 um, with with general aviation aircraft, there are some things we say to the aircraft, uh, the licensed aircraft maintenance engineer. We say that nose strut is leaking. I need you to get onto it and fix it. Or I think it's time for some new main wheel tires. And in those things, we don't need to spend a lot of time on it. But in ADSB equipment selection, this is definitely something that the wise aircraft owner will spend some time on. We have two fundamental equipment choices as we equip for ADSB. The first one is a self-contained unit. That is an ADSB uh, transponder, which incorporates a Mode S radar transponder that has an inbuilt GPS. So it can completely autonomously determine its position without necessarily needing to be integrated with the navigation equipment in the aircraft. Or the second choice is to choose a ADSB capable transponder that will obtain its position from an installed navigation system in the aircraft. And in order to meet the integrity requirements, the navigation system in the aircraft is one that needs to be certified to TSO 146 for a standalone navigation system. So when we make the decision, do we get the self-contained unit or do we get one that's going to be integrated with the navigation system? We need to think a little bit about current and future usage. For example, if the aircraft is to be flown IFR, either now or in the near future, then it's also going to need to be equipped for performance-based navigation. And through the good work that's being done by both Australia and New Zealand on the space-based augmentation system or SBAS, um, approaches with vertical guidance are going to become available and you may wish to equip for that in advance as well. Is the aircraft actually going to be flown in controlled airspace? Because if the aircraft won't be flown in controlled airspace at all, then perhaps ADSB is something that can be considered over a longer period. Is there a budget and how does the budget impact my continuing use of the aircraft? Because what we really want is for you to keep flying. So we need an equipment baseline, if you like, that corresponds to the required capabilities rather than necessarily choosing it all at the start. Here's a picture of what happens when you take the kind of choice I took eight years ago and decide to completely re-equip the aircraft uh, for uh, both performance-based navigation, approaches with vertical guidance, ADSB, uh, a new engine monitoring system, and a whole host of other features. It's definitely a good option, and it's definitely something you should pursue if those capabilities in the aircraft are something that you seek. But simple is possible too. A much easier alternative is to choose one of the three standalone uh, transponders that are available, and, and, and I don't uh, intend to endorse uh, any or all. Uh, these are choices individual owners should make. Um, and those, uh, in those uh, standalone uh, ADSB transponders, which incorporate their own GPS position source, uh, might also, for example, include uh, traffic awareness function, uh, some weather detection function uh, using spherics. Um, and, and, and they're choices that you can make without necessarily having to go through the aircraft trauma at the start. Where I'm going with this is that it's very important to consider the correct equipment for your aircraft. And the best person to make that determination is you in conjunction with the maintenance organisation or the avionics installer uh, that's going to take responsibility for getting you as the aircraft owner over the line with ADSB. What are the must-haves? It must have TSO C166B uh, and that um, it needs to be something you've discussed with the avionics installer before purchasing it because they'll take responsibility to get the installation complete. What it mustn't have is uh, the system that's confined to American lower levels called UAT. It is much better if the avionics uh, you select have uh, an STC 
or an AML STC or equivalent, and uh, and perhaps the aircraft or airframe manufacturer has prepared a service bulletin. Uh, that also makes the installation process easier and uh, less uh, complicated. And uh, there is some good guidance uh, provided by the New Zealand CAA in AC 4314, and uh, I'd um, strongly recommend having a look in there uh, to understand what the ADSB equipment uh, requirements and installation process uh, should follow. So we said the first thing was aircraft equipment and um, we've talked a little bit about that and, and, and there are obviously lots of things to consider in addition to that depending on what kind of equipment is already in the aircraft. Having put it in the aircraft, the next question is where can we use ADSB? And this is a very interesting subject and worth giving a bit of thought to. In addition, in Australia, our experience in Australia has been that in addition to its use in, a, in flying in controlled airspace under air traffic control clearances, ADSB is also of immense value when flying outside controlled airspace, uh, but within um, the range at lower levels of the air traffic control system so that directed traffic information for instrument flight rules aircraft can be obtained and air traffic controllers in Australia are providing uh, advisory information uh, to VFR aircraft who seek it uh, in a uh, flight following uh, situation. The, the principal thing to understand with ADSB compared to radar is that the ground stations can be installed in places where radar was impossible. And in the uh, presentation made yesterday by Dan Hickok from the FAA, the same uh, concept came across very clearly from what Dan was saying about uh, the ability of ADSB to satisfy service requirements in locations where the installation of uh, bulky, complex, high power requirement, uh, rotating radar heads is very difficult and very expensive whereas ADSB requires ground receivers uh, and a form of communications to satisfy the uh, various standards uh, that apply for air traffic control infrastructure. So an important feature then is that once these stations become installed and they get scattered around the country, the range obtainable by general aviation in the lower levels starts to become of considerable interest. And here in Australia, it's been amazing to see the extent of ADSB coverage in places where we never could have considered that uh, surveillance coverage would have been available. Those of you who've flown in Australia would know that prior to ADSB, our surveillance coverage was limited to this East Coast J curve. And that really beyond that, except for a little pocket in Adelaide and a little pocket over in Perth, uh, uh, the uh, radar coverage was non-existent, which meant that air traffic controllers had to issue clearances using procedural separation. So that is making sure that aircraft are separated by altitudes or by distances or by tracks that have a great deal of safety factor built into them because of the uncertainty associated with reported positions. ADSB fixes all that in a flash because in ADSB, a position better than radar is available to the air traffic controller from the start. So the air traffic controller can see where the aircraft is and clearances can be issued in a flash. For example, uh, recently, you know, two and a half weeks ago, uh, I was uh, inbound to Ayers Rock in the centre of Australia. Uh, and at 55, uh, the, and they have recently implemented um, airspace there that requires a clearance for IFR aircraft. And at 55 miles, I called uh, the air traffic controller for the clearance and the clearance came through immediately. And it came through immediately because he'd been watching me for the last hour and a half. So the potential for ADSB to ADSB coverage to leverage service into places where we previously weren't able to provide it um, is a huge uh, advantage. And it's important to leverage that coverage um, to make ADSB work. So from a pilot's perspective, perspective what, what things really have changed with ADSB? And, and there are seven of them here that I've listed on this slide. 
The first one, which we've just talked about with the map there, is better coverage than radar, and that means more flights, more of the time, whether they're VFR or IFR flights. It also has meant reduction in IFR and even some VFR position reporting, both inside and outside controlled airspace, and it's reduced radio congestion. Just before ADSB went live, we had incredible frequency congestion in the Pilbara area of the northwest of Western Australia, where there are a lot of mines. And, and so there are a lot of fly in, fly out workers who go to and from those mines uh, in medium capacity aircraft, mostly to Perth. The introduction uh, of ADSB uh, eliminated the very lengthy position reports that all of those aircraft were trying to make at different times and different waypoints that had made it very hard to get through on the frequency. And you might say, well, OK, Andrew, all right, big deal. It was a bit hard to get through on the frequency. But also understand that a bit hard to get through on the frequency means that it takes time to get a level change approved by ATC. It takes time to get onto ATC to tell them that you require a diversion because of convective weather again. It takes time to uh, get in uh, a taxiing report, even in places where there's VHF coverage on the ground, because and that in turn uh, leads to delays. So the reduction in position reporting and radio congestion has been very substantial and a, and a big uh, benefit. It also means less dependence on procedural separation, uh, greater capacity and fewer delays. And we see that in a number of regional centres as well. For example, uh, inbound to some of our Class D aerodromes in regional locations, it's now common to stay with the centre right up to the tower boundary. And then when changing to the tower, the tower already know that the aircraft is cleared to the destination. They already have an altitude. They already have the tracking details that are required. So uh, it certainly uh, improves what would have been previously complex um, situations uh, with a need for tower procedural separation. In, uh, at point four, I note more efficient routing and time and fuel savings. Even in the Cessna, we see this, uh, where ATC, knowing that the aircraft is ADSB equipped and, uh, and, and seeing the route that has been taken, can offer an off airways direct tracking where it's appropriate. And that, of course, can bring substantial uh, time and fuel savings. Reduced cost of infrastructure and services that benefits not just general aviation, but the entire industry. It benefits airlines, it benefits air traffic, the air navigation service provider, airways in, in the case of New Zealand. Uh, it's, it's a substantial benefit to the entire industry. And in turn, will it help keep costs down for general aviation to fly more and more often? These, there are certain advantages attached to the emergency capability, and Dan uh, referred to some of this yesterday when uh, talking about the use of satellite-based ADSB for emergency position uh, information uh, of aircraft that are in distress. Um, the important point to note there is that extends all the way to the surface uh, when utilising the satellite capability. And uh, that is, as I understand it, available in New Zealand and it is available to Australia and it's been used uh, to effect in the US as well. But even setting aside the satellite based capability, the um, capability for de detection by ADSB ground stations, again in areas that could not possibly have been covered by radar, uh, means that search and rescue uh, agencies can respond much more quickly uh, with greater certainty of the position to which they're proceeding. And then the final one is, 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 is a little bit hard. It's not one that we're immediately familiar with in general aviation, but it's one that we should always be thinking about. And that is a pathway to future service capability. I mentioned at the start, things are changing. And just because they're changing doesn't necessarily mean that we need to get stuck with where we are. We need to look at how we can leverage future services. ADSB has the potential to bring a much more strategic capability to air traffic control and enable pilots themselves to do much more about their own situational awareness, particularly when flying uh, VFR in the vicinity of other traffic outside controlled airspace. And we'll talk a little bit about some of that in just a moment. Um, here's some experience of taking advantage of ADSB uh, extended surveillance coverage in some pretty interesting places. Uh, there's a, a little uh, diagrammatic, uh, there's a little uh, snapshot there of, a, of an ATC display. Um, the ADSB targets in that display have uh, a little propeller 
uh, with four blades, uh, and they're distinct from uh, radar uh, returns and uh, from uh, positions that have been calculated in the Australian air traffic control system based on position reports. In the uh, in the one in the centre at the top um, is a and the and all the other green ones, the other uh, five green ones, are um, snapshots from the Australian air traffic control system where we downloaded track data that had been received by Air Services Australia and then overlaid it on a chart to see how well, in this case, my particular aeroplane uh, was working uh, with ADSB on a VFR flight at quite low levels. On that one in the centre at the top, uh, the aircraft never got above three and a half thousand feet. And you can see that right down the coast of the northwest of Western Australia, the aircraft was visible to air traffic control largely that entire time. Uh, as we go clockwise around, you can see in the uh, centre on the right uh, that the aircraft was visible to air traffic control between Birdsville and Burke. That's quite an interesting situation because at 9,000 feet between Birdsville and Burke, there is very little VHF radio coverage. So the, um, this raises the interesting point of an aircraft that's visible to air traffic control uh, on ADSB, but isn't necessarily communicating with them on the radio. Uh, similar um, considerations uh, in the bottom right corner. The bottom centre and bottom left are interesting. These are tracks produced at very low levels, close to two particularly interesting airports. The centre one is at Broome, and you can see uh, the um, little orbit that I flew there over the Broome Bird Sanctuary prior to landing at Broome. Uh, and while the important point with this is that using a tower situation display, the air traffic controllers at Broome, who, who do not use ADSB for uh, surveillance based separation, nevertheless are able to take advantage of it for situational awareness. So it's not just the pilot's situational awareness, but even in cases where the procedural uh, separation uh, must remain, they're able to use ADSB to gain uh, an appreciation of where aircraft are. And then at Airs Rock, uh, this is a really interesting one. You can see from the left of that green shot that I arrive in from the northwest, fly in over the field, uh, make a fairly tidy circuit there and land. Uh, and then um, you can see a little uh, trail to the bottom of the runway there. And uh, that is indeed me taxiing to the fuel bowser. So ADSB works. So when we talk about using ADSB for um, general aviation and taking advantage of air traffic services, what are we really talking about? We should all be seeking operational benefits for IFR and VFR general aviation, not just for jets. People fly general aviation for a whole bunch of different reasons. In, in my lifetime, I've used it to go to work. I've used it to be involved in a uh, rural business. Uh, I've used it frequently. Uh, for uh, private travel and sometimes on Sunday mornings just for a fun run up the coast. But whatever your need is, we should be seeking operational benefits uh, associated with the purpose of that of that flight. And that means getting better service from air traffic control. It means uh, looking for better routings. It means being able to utilise altitudes better because the air traffic control is not restricted to um, procedural separation. And, and look, I've listed some real experience there and I'm not going to draw, drag you through all of it, but suffice it to say that I've flown about a thousand hours uh, under ADSB now. And in the course of that uh, thousand hours, uh, I've been visible to air traffic control uh, in places like Lord Howe Island uh, and, and, and 120 miles east of Lord Howe Island, if you can think about that. Uh, obtained VFR flight following into Birdsville, Ayers Rock, down the Western Australian coast, uh, ADSB services um, of immense value around Burke, Broken Hill, Broome, Longreach and, and many others. And for us, that means, for example, that the departure report can be abbreviated because the aircraft is going to be identified immediately and is already visible to ATC uh, when the IFR aircraft becomes airborne. Um, I mentioned that in many cases we're visible to ATC under ADSB, even where we don't have VHF radio coverage. And then uh, I mentioned the streamlined uh, IFR departures, uh, less radio congestion and uh, SAR search and rescue improvement. Um, I, 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 th I think 
another part, another theme in this is that on longer flights, and, and particularly if you're traveling uh, across from one end of the country to the other, and I, and I believe the same would be true in New Zealand, uh, the potential for almost continuous um, flight information, which can be easily delivered by ATC, as opposed to requiring monumental effort to figure where the aircraft is based on uh, interpreting a range of position reports um, can be enormously valuable. Um, airline pilots, as we went through this transition, perhaps were the most surprised by the value of up-to-date traffic information in remote locations. And the one criticism that I would make of our implementation here has been that quite often for us in general aviation, uh, flying instrument flight rules, the biggest problem is knowing where the coverage actually exists. And then of course, there are the days when the weather doesn't uh, really help us too much at all. Um, that um, flight in the screenshot from the EFB product on the left of the screen um, is the kind of day where you're not actually thinking about how you get to the destination, which in this case was Bankstown in the middle of that storm, you're thinking about where you waited out. And, and indeed that is what happened. And, and we had a couple of hours on the ground at Cessnock uh, while those storms ran away. Um, in the center is just for information. Um, this is the display uh, on a um, multifunction display of uh, some spherics uh, or, or, or storm, storm scope strikes. Um, associated with a building thunderstorm and, and you can see a thunderstorm on the right. And, and the point that I'm making is that no one with any sense intentionally flies close to haz hazardous weather, but when things go wrong, if you are visible to air traffic control uh, by surveillance, as opposed to having your position uh, interpolated based on position reports, um, ATC can accurately and quickly give you traffic information. It can assess a clearance to divert around weather. It can provide navigation assistance when things go wrong. Um, and information can be provided in context. For example, uh, if you advise that you've gone missed approach at a regional aerodrome and need to divert to another aerodrome, the controller is in absolutely no doubt about where you are and what's going on. And if he needs to refer to a meta uh, or other timely information, um, that can be readily forthcoming. And our experience in Australia has been that air traffic control has taken great advantage uh, of the ADSB capability. Um, the, the other aspect of implementing ADSB in a general aviation aircraft is looking to um, leverage its capability to be received in the aircraft as well. And so this is called ADSB in. We have ADSB out where the uh, transponder broadcasts the position uh, to the ground infrastructure. And then we have ADSB in where uh, something in the aircraft is able to receive the ADSB squits or positions of other aircraft uh, and present that either on some kind of a permanently installed instrument panel display, or perhaps on an electronic flight bag that's running on an iPad uh, or tablet device uh, held by the pilot. Whichever one you use, it can be a great uh, alternative to high cost uh, and limited range active traffic systems that are known as TAS. Um, and uh, it certainly can uh, outperform uh, portable transponder detection systems that really don't ver work very well in Australia and New Zealand because we don't have enough radar heads on the ground to trigger them. Uh, and it can um, uh, overcome um, some see and avoid human limitations uh, as long as you keep that in the context of situational awareness. Um, because it can be integrated with the most popular EFB uh, applications, um, it can have great uh, benefit across the whole gamut, the whole spread, the whole spectrum of general aviation aircraft. Um, and it can be compatible with ADSB and receivers used in other uh, situations. Uh, for example, a flying club might install an ADSB receiver on the ground so that it can see when uh, aircraft are returning to the field. Here's an interesting little picture of using ADSB, which I call an ace up your sleeve. Um, this is a photo of uh, me flying the Cessna 182 from uh, Bankstown uh, just outside Sydney 
uh, down to Melbourne. And there I am in line behind uh, Jetstar 477, Qantas 441, Qantas 815, uh, the Virgin or Velocity Flight 1594. There's another one there. You'll see these guys are all sitting up at 36,000, 30,000, 32,000, and there's little OPA sitting there at 20,000. There's another green target up there. These green ones are ones that are received by the onboard aircraft equipment, and the blue ones are ones that have been uploaded by the EFB provider. The important point that I'm making is that in terms of situational awareness, this is invaluable. These aircraft will eventually descend and they will descend much faster than me and right through my flight path. But being aware of those aircraft just adds another layer of protection to that already afforded uh, by ADSB. And um, I make the comment here, it can be quite interesting once you're able to build situational awareness of what's going on around you, um, it can be quite interesting to be the littlest Eskimo. Here's another situation uh, of leveraging the uh, information that comes from ADSB. This is the uh, Richmond Air Force Base just outside Sydney. This is a particularly horrible thunderstorm. This is the planned route, which was to go overhead Richmond and down to this waypoint with Izmir and then into Bankstown. Uh, that route uh, clearly was going to put us quite close to uh, this thunderstorm. This aircraft um, was uh, reporting uh, significant turbulence and difficulties in where it was, and it needed uh, to swing uh, towards the south. And so without too much thought, it was pretty easy to come up with the suggestion to the controller and request direct to Izmir, which made the whole process much simpler. It kept us away from the storm. It created room for this guy, and it also gave a little bit of track shortening to me. That's not to say you're doing the air traffic controller's job. You mustn't, you mustn't think that. But where there are opportunities through situational awareness, uh, then you can uh, identify them and uh, you can put them into practice. Uh, here, here is a very interesting situation. This is outside controlled airspace uh, to the east of Dubbo uh, in Western New South Wales, if you're familiar with that area. And uh, in this situation, uh, you can see that uh, the Cessna is departing, um, uh, is, is, is heading towards Sydney. It's overflown uh, the major centre behind uh, and it's maintaining 9,000 feet. Um, Qantas Link 46, which is a, um, a Dash 8 aircraft, is at 7,000 on descent inbound to Dubbo, and Pelican 617 has departed Dubbo and is at 6,000 feet. The controller had the whole situation sorted, and everyone was getting um, uh, very good traffic information from the controller. But being able to see this picture made it immediately obvious to me why descending wasn't a good plan, and it also made it perfectly clear to the other aircraft why climbing wasn't a good plan. So ADSB situational awareness uh, coming from the ADSB in capability uh, can be particularly valuable. Um, let's talk a little bit about some observations. The first one, and the one that I'd uh, strongly encourage you is Pilots and particularly instrument flight rules pilots that are dependent on surveillance should be aware of the extent of ADSB coverage. And that means being involved, looking at the information as it becomes available. And that once it becomes available, the use of surveillance monitoring services should be encouraged, um, especially on longer flights or over less favorable uh, terrain. Um, the reduction in radio traffic uh, has proven in Australia to be an advantage by itself. Um, particularly in relation to getting clearances faster and uh, greater access to airspace. And if there are opportunities for route optimization, and perhaps this is more one for the uh, regulatory authorities and the air navigation service provider than individual pilots, um, if uh, the uh, capabilities of ADSB in extending surveillance coverage uh, offer those opportunities, then I believe they should be exploited to improve route, routes uh, and to uh, minimise the need for procedural separation. And then opportunities through the use of ADSB in um, are definitely ones that we in general aviation should be looking to exploit. And you know, this came up uh, yesterday uh, in the presentation that Dan gave as well with the little video. He showed us a little video of pilots in the United States who were talking about the benefits of ADSB and being able to identify traffic uh, that was um, in their area. Uh, and uh, ADSB in uh, is the key to that because it has no requirements for air traffic control. It's something that equipment that a pilot can carry 
Uh, in some cases, it can be portable. Uh, in other cases, it can be permanently installed in the aircraft. Uh, and that situational awareness can be gained. It's very important to understand that when I'm talking about situational awareness, I'm not suggesting that ADSBN should be used as the sole means of separating an aircraft from other aircraft. That's definitely not what it's for. But it's a huge advantage to have that information to be then able to visually cite uh, the aircraft based on the information that's quickly available. Much, much better to know where to look than to have to scan the whole sky. Uh, and then once the aircraft is sighted, it's quite easy to um, uh, either arrange se uh, separation individually with the pilot outside controlled airspace, uh, or just if it's flying VFR low level, simply to avoid it. Uh, they're the sorts of uh, scenarios that we want to encourage. That's largely the main points I wish to make today. I'm hoping that you found uh, the presentation interesting. There's a couple of happy pictures here from um, uh, a most enjoyable visit that I made to New Zealand and um, uh, I've been uh, greatly honoured to be able to be part uh, of um, the developments with the New Southern Sky Project, um, with SBAS and, and other developments uh, in the New Zealand civil aviation system uh, and I'm honoured uh, to have your time uh, this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andrew. Um, some excellent insights there um, on a perspective on ADSB. Um, there's lots of really good, clear examples of ADSB in as well. Although I have to say, your reference to a champagne taste on a beer budget made me think of myself in Wellington on a Saturday evening, unfortunately. <laughs> um, I have a few questions for you here, but before I shoot on to them, just a reminder to people to please do join us on pigeonhole.at and the passcode is NSS conference. It's also in the sidebar chat for you to access as well. And please do submit your questions um, that you might have for Andrew and vote on any questions that are already there. So I'll fire one or two at you now, Andrew, if you're happy for me to go ahead. Yes, go ahead, Welcome. Yeah, the first one I have um, says, Andrew, many of the advantages you list occurred because surveillance coverage was extended to new areas. What benefits can you point to within the J curve where coverage is little changed? Well, I think there's a, I think there's a few important ones there. The first one is that while there was radar coverage in the J curve at flight levels, uh, which were available to airline aircraft, they weren't available at lower and mid levels to general aviation aircraft. Uh, a classic one uh, is in the uh, Northern Tablelands area of New South Wales around Armadale and in some of those um, slightly, uh, uh, those areas slightly to the west um, of the coast along the J curve. Previously, while there was radar coverage available at flight levels, there wasn't radar coverage available at say 10,000 or 9,000 feet, and certainly not at five or 6,000 feet. So for example, inbound to Coffs Harbour, one would turn up, uh, say 10 miles before the Coffs Harbour boundary and have to go through a whole process of passing flight details to the tower to obtain a clearance to enter the Coffs Harbour control steps, still miles away, 50 miles away sometimes, at that, well, 30 miles away at those altitudes from landing, uh, at a complex process and not one that, um, um, that you'd say was enjoyable or efficient. Now, Brisbane Centre, hold us, uh, because we're identified, the Brisbane Centre control, uh, controller holds us right up until the tower controlled area uh, and simply hands us off. And at that point, they know exactly who we are and where we're going. So the J curve can be a little bit misleading in that respect. The J curve is highly effective at high, was highly effective at high altitude. It wasn't at all effective at low altitude. Excellent. Thank you, Andrew. Um, the next question for you then. Um, how would you rate how quickly air traffic controllers got to grips with ADSB and started to get smart about maximising the benefits, particularly for GA? That's a very good question. And uh, I, I, I have to um, preface all my remarks by saying that um, I have a fantastic relationship with air traffic controllers in Australia. Um, it certainly did involve adjustments for them. And to some degree, it still does, because the capabilities are really quite surprising. Um, for example, uh, an aircraft which has planned to depart uh, a particular location 
um, on the visual flight rules and intends to remain that way until it becomes uh, visible to air traffic control and on VHF contact to then enter controlled airspace under the instrument flight rules um, can be a little bit of a mystery to some controllers and, and it took them a while to have to adjust to those situations. But generally speaking, they moved quite smartly and there were two reasons for that. The first one is because at the baseline, the baseline of the controller's interaction with the pilot was no was was not really any different to the way they were interacting uh, using radar surveillance. In other words, the procedures uh, largely passed across. Yeah, there's a few little phraseology changes, and we all need to get used to saying identified, not radar identified. Uh, the second um, uh, part of that was that the types of en route surveillance services um, that have been of great benefit to us here had already been being provided for many years to aircraft in the flight levels, um, to jet aircraft. And those services, as they became available to general aviation, actually gave the controllers some incentives to um, utilise them as well, particularly in offering direct tracking uh, to get an aircraft away from perhaps uh, a um, location where there's intensive navigation uh, aid training going on and the location is already uh, quite um, uh, crowded by other aircraft. So um, the answer to the question is uh, yes, it was a, it was an adjustment, but from my observations, it, it didn't take too long. Great, thanks, Andrew. Um, I've got two questions here. They're somewhat um, interlinked, so I'll try and sequence them appropriately for you. Um, the first one says, this may be a bit of a personal question, but do your family flight follow you on Flight Radar 24 using ADSV? I've been told it's been really useful for flying clubs to keep an eye on students. Uh, the answer to that is absolutely yes. Um, and uh, both on long trips and short trips, um, I have a couple of followers who have an alert set up and, and 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 they say, I saw you yesterday. You were going to, and and I always smile at, the, at, at that. That's I've got a few friends who do that, uh, but um, particularly um, my son and daughter, particularly, are always keen to see where I'm off to in the plane next, and um, uh, if they know I'm going to uh, Western New South Wales, for example, to do some work uh, or going up the coast, um, they 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 frequently do keep an eye on it and and uh, an idea of when I'll be back. Great, thanks, Andrew. I think you've covered off the second part of that question as well, actually. <laughs> so I'll move on. I'll move on to the next one. Um, so the next question is, how are you learning about ATC's ADSB coverage in Australia? Um, is this from a published coverage map by asking them local knowledge or other? That's, a, that's, that's also an excellent question. At the moment, we're working uh, on information provided to us on Air Services Australia website, um, which is which is very useful. It's 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 good, and and by uh, having a good look at it, um, you can get a pretty good idea of where it is. Um, there's a number of us in the GA advocacy groups um, who would like to see uh, ADSB coverage included uh, on the same planning chart uh, that currently, for example, uh, provides information about. VHF radio coverage, uh, and we think that that would be advantageous. So that's that's the primary means. But the other means is the good old um, Mark One eyeball and ear. Uh, where you hear aircraft departing uh, from your uh, stopover destination, for example, and you can hear them being identified uh, shortly after becoming airborne, then that's a pretty good clue that ADSB coverage uh, is going to be available to you when you subsequently depart that location and you start to get um, some of those things together. But um, uh, yes, it's a it's it's a, um, a bit of a hybrid process uh, and it's perhaps not presented in as much detail as uh, many of us would like. Great, thanks Andrew. Um, the next question then, they're coming in thick and fast. <laughs> Please do keep them coming in uh, as you have them. The next one is, we have a problem in New Zealand of many times having ATC asking GA to, oh, sorry, the question has just moved on me as the votes are coming in so quickly. Bear with me one second while I just make sure I have it here in front of me. It's the question I'm asking is getting so many votes, you see, it's moving up the screen in front of me. So I'll just repeat it again, sorry. We have a problem in New Zealand of many times having ATC asking GA to vacate controlled airspace because of work pressures an annoying habit. 
Has this diminished in Australia with ADSB? Uh, I believe that yes. The, uh, the short answer is yes, it has. Um, perhaps not so much in Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, uh, and in, in and in that surrounding airspace because there was always good surveillance coverage there anyway. Where we've seen the advantages are in the areas that were previously subject only to procedural separation. So the control steps around places like Coffs Harbour, Tamworth, uh, and a number of other locations, uh, the control steps around Ayers Rock, for heaven's sake, um, are, uh, are now subject to ADSB surveillance services, and those surveillance services are not are not utilised for clearances by the tower as they used to be. The towers used to control those uh, wedding cake steps that bring you down into the towered airspace from the overlying um, airspace, but instead those uh, locations, the airspace um, management has morphed into the provision of those services by the centres. And where the centres have been managing airspace access based on um, surveillance rather than on uh, fl whole flight levels blocked out using procedural separation, um, then, the, then uh, a number of those problems um, have got away. I think I think it's fair to say that the one thing that confounds air traffic controllers in Australia, and we've had this conversation with them a few times, are the pop-ups with no warning. And and so I do encourage pilots in Australia who are encountering those sorts of problems to file a flight plan. Uh, for example, people who want to do Harbour Scenics uh, in Sydney uh, without providing advance notification. Um, the issue is that to provide the details to the air traffic controller on the frequency um, in order to gain a clearance, um, is itself a task that a busy approach or departures controller simply struggles to find the time for. So, so we do encourage um, pilots here to provide um, advanced notification of those flights. But in terms of being told to vacate the airspace to accommodate other aircraft, I think what we're seeing here instead is a confinement of operations. So, um, for example, uh, uh, it might involve uh, no further south than this particular boundary, or it might be um, uh, remain at or below uh, 1,500. Uh, clearances worded to that effect based on the fact that surveillance separation uh, can be applied to the aircraft, assuming that it complies with the clearance that's been given. Excellent. Thank you, Andrew. Um, now, this is a theoretical question because there are many uh, benefits from ADSB, and luckily you don't have to choose between them. But if you were given just one benefit that you could have from ADSB, what would that be? That is a hard question, and it's a top up. It's a toss. It's a com it's a toss up between facilitating the use of ADSB in situational awareness. Uh, that would be perhaps uh, top of my list. But the other thing, top of my list, is the thing I've been banging on about all all evening, um, which is um, the improvement in the delivery of clearances and visibility of the aircraft prior to entering controlled airspace to ATC. So uh, I put both of those together as, as a joint favourite. OK, that's a little bit of a cheat, Andrew, but I'll let you away with it. <laughs> Um, fantastic. We just have one more question that is on the list here and um, before I let you go and I have to say I'm not going to hold you um, to uh, be completely and solely responsible for whether this will be true or not. But hi Andrew, air services say that Santa has fitted an ADSB to his sled. Is it true that NZ Flyer should be asking for ADSB in their Christmas stockings this year? Well, I have to say I've never actually had a problem in getting a clearance because of Santa. <laughs> so I'm pleased that he's installed ADSB and and he doesn't seem to pop up in the Sydney control zone too frequently, which is probably um, just as well, especially at the moment. Um, in terms of um, in terms of what whether you're getting one in the stocking, the one thing that I would say, and it goes back to the remarks I made right at the very start, Lorcan, the um, we had initial issues here because of the limited equipment, the limited range of equipment involved for many aircraft higher costs. However, the market has moved forward 
and that situation no longer applies. When, when we began installing ADSB in Australia, none of those uh, ADSB transponders fitted with GPS with an integral GPS were available. So everyone who installed ADSB in an aircraft in Australia uh, seven or eight years ago could only install it in conjunction with a navigation system uh, certified to TSO C146. In addition, uh, despite the best efforts of many of us in GA advocacy, Australia was unable to proceed uh, with proposal for assistance for aircraft owners and a subsidy. Um, New Zealand is in a great position because it's been able to overcome both of those problems. Uh, first, you've put in place uh, a subsidy program, which uh, I think is um, uh, highly commendable. And the second one, of course, is that uh, these um, ADSB transponders with an integral GPS position source um, are available now. And uh, that has greatly reduced the cost. Um, the, the cost of ADSB equipment is driven by the need for integrity in the ADSB position source. It's not driven by the transponder. And by integrating the GPS into the transponder, the manufacturers of these things um, have been able to drive their costs down substantially. So in many ways, perhaps New Zealand aircraft owners have got a little bit in their Christmas stocking. Excellent, thank you Andrew. So long as they don't get any lumps of coal in the stocking as well, that's fine. Um, so I'm going to close the uh, question and answer session at that point. Um, I'd just like to extend my thanks um, to you Andrew for um, speaking with us this evening. It's been great to hear from you and I'd just like to remind our participants as well that we have our final session of the webinar series tomorrow evening when we will have um, the ADSB technical advisor for the grant scheme that you mentioned, um, Tom Gormley, who will be speaking about the New Zealand context, best practice and key information and an, also an update about that grant scheme that you mentioned. Um, so please do join us again tomorrow evening as we close our conference with that session as well. Um, apart from that, I will pass over to Director of New Southern Sky, Steve Smith, for a few closing comments from us. Thanks, Steve. Hey, thanks Lorcan and thank you everybody that's joined us tonight. It's been great to have you all on board. And Andrew, thank you once again. It's always very enjoyable to listen to you and hear from you about your experiences with ADSB in particular. But the main thing is we always learn learn a lot and tonight was no different. Uh, it was terrific to hear those magic lessons, particularly that Ace up your sleeve bit about ADSB, and I thought that was terrific. We're going to try and use that again on the website if you can give us permission to do so, because that's so so valuable to us having that real personal experience passed on to us. So uh, once again, Andrew, a terrific briefing. Uh, I particularly like the bad weather day benefits <laughs> when things go wrong. Uh, that really made me think back to my flying days and uh, made a connection for me. So look, Andrew, um, I'm sorry you couldn't be with us in person, but you've you've done a great job for us tonight and we really, really appreciate it. And we'll be back in touch again with, with you soon. No doubt comparing notes on ADSB, SBAS and everything else to do with general aviation. So thanks again, Andrew, and uh, good night to everybody who's joined us here on the second New Southern Sky webinar. Good evening. <laughs>